right, so let's get started. Um, if you would like to grab anything to eat, feel free to get up and grab something. Um, my name is Brendan Schechter. I'm the Elihu Rose uh, Scholar in Modern Military History here at New York University. And I'd like to start off by thanking the Jordan Center, Elihu Rose, who sponsors these lectures, which are the Elihu Rose Lectures in Modern Military History, and the History Department here at NYU for, for sponsoring us. Um, and it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Betsy Damon who is an assistant professor of history and environment and society at Brown University. She got her PhD from Berkeley in 2016. Has been awarded n fellowships too numerous to count and enumerate mm -hmm. here, but among them were the Fulbright Hayes and also the best dissertation in history from UC Berkeley Friends of Cal. Uh, she's the author of the forthcoming The Floating Coast, an environmental history of the Bering Strait, which will be published by Norton um, at the end of the summer. And also the author of uh, many articles, including Ice in the Machine, Ecology in the State, and Chukotkin Walrus Hunting Collectives, 1920 to 1960, uh, The Walrus and the Bureaucrat, Energy, Ecology, and Making the State in the Russian and American Arctic, 1870 to 1950, which came out in the last issue of the American Historical Review, uh, Grounding Capitalism, Geology, Labor, and the Known Gold Rush, which is a chapter in Gold Rush, a Global History, and also more things on heaven and earth, modernism, and reindeer in Kutka and Alaska. Chapter in Northscape's History, Technology, and the Making of Northern Environments. Uh, her interest in the, the subjects that she studies uh, come as a deep uh, biographical rooting. Uh, that Shiva took uh, two gap years between high school and college to live in the far north, and is actually an accomplished dog sledder, uh, was embedded in the native community, an indigenous community, and she also served in the Peace Corps in Moldova uh, after graduating from Brown in 2017. 2007. I wish it was 2017. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it made me very impressive. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm just going to turn things over to Beth Shiva, um, who will give us a great lunchtime talk about this. Yeah. Um, so, thank you, Brandon, for inviting me, and doubly thank you for re inviting me because I was supposed to give this talk in March, um, but was too febrile to get on a train. Um, so I'm here in May, and thank you all for coming because it's, I know, that point in the semester when nobody has any time for anything, and it's beautiful outside, um, so I really appreciate it. Um, I need to issue an apology and a disclaimer. Um, the apology is there are going to be lots of photographs of whale parts, um, and it's a lunch talk, and there was really very little I could do about that, um, so brace yourself. Uh, second disclaimer is I am by no stretch of the imagination a military historian. My uh, pardon to <clears throat> Mr. Rose. Um, and I don't even in sort of a traditional sense study the Cold War. Um, and I'm instead an environmental historian of the US and Russian Arctic and pay particular intersection uh, or pay particular attention to the intersection between um, the lives of people and various kinds of animals in the Arctic. And what I'm going to talk about today focuses on the relationship between our species um, and cetaceans, which is to say whale species, um, and a variety of species of whales, mostly during the 1950s and the 1970s. And I'm going to mostly talk about how and why Soviet and American ways of understanding cetaceans and the value of what a whale is um, diverge in this particular period of time. And it's partly a Cold War story um, in that it's about a sort of clash and a division of human values that very much follows lines that are set up by the Cold War political context. But it's also a hot war story, if you think about it from the perspective of the whales, um, who in the decades that I discuss here, um, the tally of cetaceans that are killed by human beings would reach nearly three million animals. Um, so underneath this is a story of uh, a pretty dramatic refashioning of the world's oceans, only part of which is done by the Soviet Union. Um, but I'm going to focus primarily on what the Soviets um, are doing and then talk a little bit at the end about sort of the American counterpoint. Um, and it's really a story of kind of the ironic transformation of Soviet aspirations for their relationship with cetacean species. Um, the Soviet Union starts whaling in, um, off of the Chukchi Peninsula in the Russian Far East. Um, where they had been witness to decades of capitalist killing of great whale species. Um, and they very much start with the ambition of not repeating those mistakes. But by the end of the era that I'm going to talk about today, they have not just repeated them, they have exceeded them. 
and in the process, they very much go from having a set of ways of understanding whales that allow for valuing whales as living organisms um, to really only being able to imagine the animals as having any value when they're dead. And this tra trajectory is, again, kind of an ironic inverse of what will happen to the ways that Americans understand whales in the same period, which is at the beginning of the 20th century, most Americans only understood whales as having particular value when they had been turned into blubber and uh, baleen. But by the 1970s, um, understanding whales as having value and kind of a particular sort of mythical value as living animals um, had become a sort of a sign of national enlightenment. Like, sort of truly progressive countries were ones that understood whales this way. So where this story picks up um, for the Soviet Union is in the, is in the Far East, um, off the coast of Chukotka, which is the peninsula that, if you see the kind of red dot um, that's on the... Oh, thank you. Can you see? I, I'm totally fine, yeah, thank you. Um, so Chukotka is right across from this, this red dot here, this peninsula. Um, and it's a very small program when the Soviets started. They have this one um, kind of broken down factory ship called the Aluit, um, which is primarily hunting off the coast of Kamchatka and, and Chukotka. And it's a program that's run with the heavy involvement at the beginning of Soviet marine biologists um, who had spent a long time um, both observing capitalist whaling at the very end of the, the 19th and the early 20th century. Some of them were old enough to have sort of remembered actually seeing capitalist whaling ships um, <coughs> from New England and from San Francisco, hunting right off the, the Russian coast. Um, and many of them had studied in pretty minute detail records of American whalers. Um, and so they enter their own whaling industry um, with a really sharp critique of what industrial level whaling looks like. Um, and they have sort of two major um, ways in which they are skeptical of what the Americans had done before. The first is that Americans are incredibly wasteful in the way that they hunt whales. They primarily kill them uh, for the blubber and for the baleen, which means that you know thousands and thousands of pounds of animals are just left to float and rot. Um, and by the early 20th century, they're not even killing them for blubber anymore. They're just killing them for baleen, which are the, the kind of long plastic-like feeding apparatus um, that certain species of whales have in their mouth. So there's kind of a critique in the, um, the early Soviet archive of this sort of completely irrational way in which Americans kill whales. And the, the second line of critique is that this had led to the utter impoverishment of the indigenous populations living along uh, the, the Chukchi coast. Um, and it was, this is also a completely accurate critique in that um, several decades of American whaling had so decimated the populations of bowhead and gray whales that indigenous populations that had hunted them uh, for several thousand years at that point no longer had consistent access to them. So when the Soviets sort of get the Aluit and start whaling, they're doing it with the kind of express ambition of not killing excessively. Uh, they think of this as being a project that will have uh, real limits and requires kind of a limited appetite for whales. Um, and they simply want to do it more efficiently um, and bring in whale carcasses so that local people can eat. And this kind of vision of whaling really kind of stays with the Soviet program through the 1930s, which is actually somewhat interesting given that many other Soviet industries in the 1930s are busy getting rid of limits altogether. Um, there's not really a lot of stakhanovite action on, on the Aleut. Partly this is simply because it's uh, technologically not the greatest whale ship around and, and they have lots of uh, just basic problems with operation that keep them from excess in some ways, but it's also because there is this sense that that would sort of violate the why Soviet whaling is different than American whaling uh, <clears throat> had been. But this kind of concern about limits starts to kind of fade a little bit during the Second World War. Um, and it does so for a reason that makes a lot of sense, which is that the country was in a state of real caloric crisis. Um, and the Soviet Union needed all sorts of food, and they need fat in particular. Um, and protein is also very much desired for the front. Um, so one of the marine biologists who had been working on the, this, the Aleut um, and who had kind of a sense of, de or a desire for whale conservation, actually writes a letter to Stalin um, in the early years of the war and says, look, we, we have this real opportunity out here in the Far East to produce far more protein and fat uh, for the war effort. 
um, if you can just you know, give us a better technology, we could really help with this. Um, and the, the fisheries industry in the Far East starts developing all these recipes for how you can make whale meat more palatable to people who aren't accustomed to eating it, and you know, what, how much spice you have to put in uh, to make it something that people on the front lines might actually want to eat. Um, but the Soviet Union during the Second World War was quite busy building other kinds of ships and using their, their metal uh, for other kinds of things, so they don't actually launch a fleet um, in the 1940s. Um, and in fact, basically, the whole world stops killing whales. Um, it's a really particularly good time in the 20th century to be a cetacean because human beings are so busy killing each other um, that they don't really have any time to go after whales. Um, and researchers have actually been able to kind of reconstruct the um, historical trajectory of whale stress by looking at the cortisol levels in whale earwax. Um, and it shows pretty clearly that cortisol levels in whales drop in 1940, and they don't go back up again until 1946. Um, so basically, this, this interregnum, which is a human tragedy, turns out to be pretty good if you're a whale. But what the Soviet Union kind of exits um, the Second World War with is this, um, <clears throat> this kind of sense that they really could be using whale species in a new um, and perhaps more intensive way. Um, and this um, is really kind of codified um, at the 21st Party Congress after Khrushchev sort of announces that the full-scale building of communism is in place. Gosplan uh, very specifically writes um, an expanded whaling fleet um, into their ambitions for sort of what uh, this, this vision of communism is going to look like. Um, but they also do this at a moment when uh, the kind of caloric necessity of all that whale fat and the whale meat is really starting to diminish since it's by the late 50s. So in some ways, when I started this project, my real question was, why do the Soviets keep whaling? Um, <coughs> and they put whale at particular excess in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, and so I'm going to spend sort of the rest of this talk kind of going through the three reasons, which I'm sure are not complete, in part because um, many of the Soviet whaling records are in the KGB archive, and they're not particularly amenable to me reading them. Um, the sort of three ways of interpreting why it is that the Soviet whaling program uh, so departs from its kind of original desire for uh, limited and kind of um, non-capitalist forms of production, um, and why it exists after the kind of material necessity of the, of the Second World War seems like it would be a real issue. And the first of those reasons, I think, has to do with the kind of work um, that took place on the Soviet whaling ships themselves. Um, and these ships were um, commissioned by Gosplan. Um, there's uh, several fleets of them. One of them kind of works in Antarctica, which I actually don't know much about at all. Um, but there's a historian named Ryan Jones who's working very specifically on Soviet whaling in Antarctica. Um, and then the Aluit, which is working in the North Pacific, is joined by the Sovietska Rasiya in 1962. Um, and then the next year, two other big whaling ships, the Vladivostok and the Dalnivostok, um, also start working in the North Pacific. And these are really um, massive. Uh, whaling ships. The ones down here in the corner that are in the black and white um, are the central factory processing ships that their job was to kind of break down the whales once they've been killed. Um, and then the color photo at the top is one of the catcher ships, um, which are still you know, large enough that people would live and sleep on board them. Um, but they were the ones that actually really went out after the whales. Um, this is a picture here. They're um, hauling a whale in that's been harpooned. Um, and that's the harpoon gun you can kind of see in silhouette at the top. So the, the catcher ships would, or the, the processing ship, the sort of central one like the Dalmi Vostok or the Vladivostok would have 10 to 20 of these catcher ships um, as part of a fleet and they sort of operated as a unit. And the people who worked on these ships came from all over the Soviet Union um, and they did all sorts of tasks. They were, you know, the crews were usually several hundred people um, and they would kind of recreate sort of the, everything that you would need to have a small functioning Soviet town. Um, You'd have mechanics, you'd have dentists and doctors, um, there'd be KGB officers and members of the party, um, there'd be people whose job was to sort of promote literacy, um, and then there would be all of the people whose jobs are in some way connected to turning whales into some sort of product. Um, so the people working on 
the catcher boats um, who are skilled harpooners or captains, um, and then the people on the central factory ship whose job it is to take a whale and turn it into small pieces that can then be kind of counted toward the plan. Um, and like pretty much any Soviet industry, they are getting their, their sort of orders about what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to do from Gosplan. Um, and Gosplan had these um, sort of amazing charts, which if you've ever worked with Soviet production would be very familiar of, you know, we're going to get this many tons of bone meal for fertilizer and this many tons of um, vitamin A from whale livers and, you know, <coughs> this many thousands of cans of whale meat um, every year. Whether or not anyone ever ate the whale meat is not a thing I have been able to track down, but there were plans for it. But the, the thing about the work on the whale ships is that um, it lends itself very much to kind of Soviet ideal models of what labor should be. Um, partly because human beings have always had to kill whales collectively. It's not a, a job that you can go out and do as a single person because they're just simply so large. Um, and the, the whaling on these mechanized ships was sort of a perfect combination of collective work that could also have um, sort of a clear hero of so socialist labor kind of out front leading it. Usually the, that hero was the harpooner um, because that's the sort of singular act from which all other production of whale products starts. You have to kill the whale first. Um, and so these harpooners often had kind of uh, positions of great prestige um, and they were often sort of given medals for their, their contributions to labor. Um, but their work had to be supported by the people who did sort of the, the rest of uh, the whaling labor, which after harpooning meant finding the whale carcasses and pumping them full of air, as you can see with these fin whales in the middle photo, so that they didn't sink, um, and then tagging them with a radio receiver so that the factory ship could find them. Um, and then once on board ship, um, the whales have to be taken to all sorts of peace so that they can be turned into those you know, planned um, <clears throat> piles of fertilizer and oil and vitamin supplements and all the other things that they were supposed to produce. And so this fit the kind of Soviet ideals of labor that really go back to Lenin very clearly, right? That you would have sort of a heroic person who is out front leading the charge, giving the sense of what the sort of maximalist vision of Soviet production could be, and then you have the collective that's really holding this person up um, and allowing for this really kind of triumphant labor. Um, and you can see this in various kind of Soviet publications and newspapers in particular. Um, it's all over in Pravda, and it's also um, on the kind of onboard newspapers that the whaling ships would produce, and kind of the ways in which they talked about um, labor really kind of fall into this ideal model of production. And if you were an underperformer, as in many Soviet industries, you were critiqued openly in the onboard ship paper as kind of a shaming mechanism to get better. Um, and if you overperformed or overfilled or exceeded the plan, um, you would often get kind of a hero's welcome when you return back to port and get sort of publicized nationally. And there was also real material benefits. Um, whalers on the, on the ships, if they um, met the plan targets, got a 10% bonus. And if they exceeded plan targets, they could get a 25% salary bonus. And they tended to be pretty well-paying jobs um, to begin with. And particularly if you were on the cruises that went to Antarctica, you got to stop in all sorts of um, exotic ports on the way. You could spend time in New Zealand and in Paraguay um, and in other countries. So there were also real kind of material as well as ideological benefits uh, for the whalers to just kind of keep whaling and keep participating in this. And in the early parts of the Soviet whaling program, one of the things that's really striking is that the capacity not just to fill the plan but exceed the plan can be done year after year after year. It's a moment when there are enough whales that are still kind of in the global oceans that there's no problem um, kind of becoming a hero of socialist labor, earning that 25% bonus um, because the Soviet fleet is able to so successfully kill uh, so many whales. But this, of course, means that Soviet whalers um, were very, very far beyond the kind of vision of whaling that the program started with that involved thinking very carefully about the age and the size of the whales you kill and making sure that you avoid killing female whales that have calves. Um, and it starts to be kind of a race just to simply kill any whale that you can find. Um, 
And this means that the marine biologists that are still traveling with the Soviet whaling fleet start being alarmed uh, by the middle of the 1960s by what they see as practices that are going to lead the, the industry into ruin. Um, and they start reporting back to Gosplan that unless the, the kind of plan targets come down, um, there's going to be, you know, that the industry will fall apart relatively quickly because the whales will simply be exterminated. Um, but the Goth Plan's response is basically to tie up all of those uh, reports, um, and they stamp the file secret, um, as one of the whale biologists described, and they just sort of stick them in an archive. They don't really do much with them. Instead, Goth Plan says the real thing that will kind of keep whaling alive um, is just better technology, which it turns out is exactly the thing that most capitalist whalers said for most of the whaling industry. If you just make the technology better, it will be fine. We won't have any problem with the fact that we're suddenly now killing immature whales most of the time, um, or the fact that we're going further and further afield because we can't find the kind of whales we used to kill. And what this meant is that by the 1960s, um, the Soviet Union, which was a, a signatory member of the International Whaling Commission, um, is no longer able to kill within the kind of prescribed limits that the IWC sets out. Um, and the International Whaling Commission has all sorts of problems with the kind of levels it's setting because it has no actual regulatory power to begin with. Um, but nevertheless, um, even the kind of very minimal standards that the, the IWC has in place are things that the Soviet Union just regularly starts blowing past. Um, and as one uh, captain wrote back in the 1960s, um, he made it very clear, he said, in total, illegal whales represented 68.3% of whales by number and 48.6% of whales by weight on the Dalny Vostok. And he says that, quote, if the fleet had strictly followed the regulations, the yearly plan target would not have been fulfilled. So the captains on the ships knew very well that the International Whaling Commission regulations, if they wanted to make the plan, had to be sort of dispensed with entirely. And part of the, the Soviet Union's approach to this was that they, they basically kept two sets of whaling books on their whaling fleet after the middle of the 1960s. Um, the KGB would keep one that was sort of the official stats, or the, the captain would, and then they would keep one that was sort of specially cooked so that it uh, could go to the International Whaling Commission. Um, and what they would often do is if they killed a whale that had been, was too young or um, was a species that was particularly protected or something like that, they would just sort of rewrite it in the records as being, you know, one illegal blue whale becomes three legal humpback whales or something like that. So there's a lot of creative mathematics that thankfully a couple of marine biologists in Seattle actually painstakingly went through and actually counted up to figure out which are the whales that were actually killed. I'm very grateful to them because it would have been years of my life to even attempt um, to make your way through these records. But as a result, about 150,000 additional whales than what's reported to the International Whaling Commission end up being killed in the 60s by the early 70s. And this, I think, from kind of reading the ways in which whaling captains and some of the other um, people involved in the Soviet whaling industry is sort of the second reason why whaling continues and why it continues at such excess, um, which is that many of the, the whaling captains by the 1950s um, have witnessed the ways in which capitalist whaling has been so unbelievably excessive historically. Some of them kind of have knowledge of it because they come from the Russian Far East, um, which has sort of a, a long-term understanding of American whaling as robbing Russians of whales that swam in their territorial waters. Uh, and then they also saw what capitalist whaling looked like in the 20th century, which was you know, unrestrained killing um, or very nearly unrestrained. The International Whaling Commission is sort of a band-aid over this kind of industrial excess. And they also see um, Aristotle Anassis, who basically flaunts the International Whaling Commission regulations in the late 1950s, receive no penalty. Um, and so some of the Russian whaling captains start saying pretty openly that they don't think that capitalism has any capacity to curb its own appetites, and that it's simply trying to regulate the Soviet Union to keep them from having access. Um, to the same things that, that capitalists have been doing, in fact, for centuries, um, that the Soviet Union is only a couple decades into participating in. Um, and so the, there's kind of a sense in which the Soviet Union is um, whaling in excess because they already understand the excess 
uh, to be perpetrated by uh, the, the kind of capitalist world. Um, Ryan Jones, who I mentioned earlier, calls this revenge socialism, that there's like this sense in which, you know, the American whalers in particular, even though the Americans aren't whaling at all at this point, have done such a disservice to the world's oceans um, that what the Soviet Union is going to do is just kind of top that, because if they don't do it, you know, Britain will get the whales anyway. But there's kind of another reason in which, in the 1960s and the 1970s in particular, I think that whaling um, was attractive to Soviet planners at sort of an even higher level, which is that they were completely aware of the environmental impact of what was happening. They were sort of being briefed regularly by um, marine biologists from within the Soviet Union about the, the kind of cost of the program. But it was one of the places where the Soviet Union could export the negative environmental consequences of industrialization, um, which is something that, of course, the United States is becoming extremely good at in the 1950s and the 1960s. There's all of this legislation passed in the US to take kind of the, um, the, all of the bad parts of industrial modernity and push it outside of US borders. So you've passed the Clean Air Act, you pass the Clean Water Act, you make your citizens at home live in spaces that are nicer and cleaner and you just simply push that industry usually into the global south and make other people deal with the really negative consequences. But Soviet whaling was a place where the Soviet Union could do that too, where in many ways the really negative consequences of whaling were felt very far from Soviet space, um, and it was a way of kind of uh, participating and projecting that um, outside of the Soviet Union. So I see there being kind of these three layered ways in which whaling, not because the whales themselves actually had all that much value to the Soviet Union, they don't really seem to have. Um, in fact, it's really hard to track what happens to the whales after they hit port, but a lot of them don't even make it that far. Um, there are so many kind of mechanical malfunctions aboard the whaling ships that they lose freezers full of whale meat all the time. Um, they lose bone meal at sea. Sometimes they kill whales and they don't even process them at all. Um, they just sort of add them to the tallies. So they're not doing it for a direct material reason, but participating in this kind of socialist labor um, and being able to take real pride in it because it's a thing that the Soviet Union clearly does so well and whalers are able to kind of see in an international context that they're doing well. You know, at a moment when the Soviet Union is you know, suddenly importing grain um, because they're no longer sort of keeping up um, on the agricultural front or at a moment when you know, the United States lands a man on the moon um, after the Soviets had you know, for so long had pride of place in the space race, I think there was a real sense of meaning that came from the work um, at the level of the whalers themselves. And then there was the fact that at a sort of more diplomatic level, there was a sense that this was asserting, this was actual Soviet internationalism in some real sense, um, and that it was undermining capitalism sort of at its own game that was very meaningful, and then third, that it kind of allowed this projection um, of the sort of ills of industrial life outside of Soviet space. And the, of course, the result of this is that it's terribly hard um, on the world's whale population. Um, and it's hard on the world's whale population because none of those ways of valuing whales that I just described has any use for a living animal. Right. They only become part of these sort of Soviet ideas and ways of understanding them as having worth once they've been killed. Um, and so by the, 19, the end of the 1960s and the early 1970s, the Soviets are regularly killing lactating whales, they're killing infants, um, and they're killing species that um, they're almost always hunting juveniles because they, there are simply too, too few whales left. Although it bears repeating that most of the whales killed in the 20th century are killed for market whalers, not by Soviets. They just sort of do it for the longest. But what's interesting about this is that, oh, this is a picture, uh, sorry, I forgot about this slide, of the, the kind of triumphant return of the whaling ships into the port in Vladivostok. If you worked on the catcher ship that uh, killed the most whales, you got to sail into port first. Um, and people I've talked to in Vladivostok still remember this kind of return of the whalers every year. And there's a lot of pride still in Vladivostok about the, the whaling fleet. Um, and then there was a way in which the Soviet program was used kind of in soft power um, projections, um, as in the case of this female uh, harpooner uh, who was sort of very celebrated, um, even to the point of being translated into the 
this English language uh, publication. Um, and this is just a sense of where the Soviet ships um, were going in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, they're basically tracing all over um, the, 19, or the, the North Pacific um, up into the Bering Sea. And then you can see down in the corner, they're actually heading down um, and they're whaling right off the coast of California, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and this is one of the forms that when a whale is killed, in theory, you had to fill out this thing called a whale passport and send it to the International Whaling Commission with you know, the age and the, well, theoretical age, the, the sex, where it was killed, um, all of this kind of stuff. And these are the things that were often forged so that you could take um, you, whales that the International Whaling Commission had prohibited from being killed, like right whales, um, and <coughs> blue whales, and you could turn them into a legal whale. Um, But while all this is happening, while the Soviet Union is kind of enacting these, these various visions at sea with whale bodies and are very much kind of drifting away from that original vision where whale hunting was potentially a very important thing and it had regional importance, but it needed to be limited so that whales would continue to exist into the future, um, which is to say the Soviets start valuing some whales alive and end up valuing whales only dead, the Americans are doing the exact opposite thing. Partly this is because the United States, by the middle of the 20th century, has no domestic whaling industry at all. Um, it had been a world leader in whaling in the 19th century, but it really does not change from the tall ship New England Yankee whaling era into the, the modern kind of Norwegian and British um, industrial whaling era. Um, and it really is the Norwegians and British who do a vast amount of the whaling um, in the 20th century, uh, aside from the Soviets. Um, and if you grew up you know, in Great Britain prior to you know, the, the Second World War and a little bit after the Second World War and you ate margarine, there's a pretty good chance that it was made out of whale. Um, and the same thing is true in Norway, that this was kind of the, a major way of getting fats for the country. Um, the company Unilever, which is now this massive conglomerate that sells all sorts of household goods, is actually a whaling company originally. Um, and gets a cosmetic kind of spin-off because they have whale fat that they use in various kinds of face creams. Um, but they also made margarine um, for a long time. But by the late 1960s, the number of whales in the world's oceans was making hunting them so expensive that Great Britain and uh, Norway are mostly moving into other kinds of fats. So they're starting to use palm oil, um, rapeseed oil, things like that um, as a replacement for whales. And most whale products that entered the market were for dog food, um, some which was bought from Japan. Some of that might have actually come from the Soviet Union because sometimes the Soviets would sell whale meat to Japan, but since I can't read Japanese, I've never been able to like follow the, follow the meat th uh, through Japan and out again. Um, and people used whale oil and particularly spermaceti oil, which comes from the uh, hearing organ of sperm whales in their head. Um, to lubricate car transmissions. Um, so if you drove a Ford car in the 1960s, it probably had whale oil in the transmission, um, and it was used to lubricate intercontinental ballistic missiles um, and nuclear submarines because it has an extremely low friction rate. But most people in the United States had very little idea that whale oil was in their car transmissions and had instead started to think about whales um, as these kind of mystical, um, kind of charismatic megafauna that kind of symbolized um, the ways in which people could learn from nature as opposed to simply extract uh, value from it. Um, and the, the 19, late 1960s and particularly the early 1970s has this huge kind of upwelling of whale-related cultural um, material in the United States. Um, Roger Payne publishes this record album of humpback whale songs which I, I swear everybody owned a copy of, I and mean, it was on the, the top of the billboard charts, um, even though it didn't star any human beings at all. Um, and then there's a series of TV shows that feature cetaceans of various kinds, um, Flipper probably being the best known. Um, and then Farley Moet publishes this book called A Whale for the Killing, which kind of very directly um, kind of profiles the way in which the human treatment of whales is kind of a sign of the, the fallen nature of industrial humanity and the need to sort of return to kind of a more balanced and harmonious 
uh, relationship with nature. And Farley Mowat also kind of breaks the, the news in this story that the American nuclear program is using whale brain oil, essentially, to lubricate missiles. Um, and this idea gets picked up um, by a group of activists in Vancouver who had started as anti-nuclear activists, um, but become known as Greenpeace. Um, and they make the shift to, to whales kind of by making this connection between nuclear annihilation of people and the species annihilation of whales by industrial whaling ships. Um, and Greenpeace and the Soviet Union end up really sort of taking these two ways of valuing whales and putting them into direct sort of physical contact with each other. Um, it starts in the summer of 1973 um, when a group of Greenpeace activists who had been spending a lot of time with gray whales off the coast of Canada um, and they would sort of they were trying to communicate with the whales. They would go out and play music to the whales or meditate around the whales. And um, as one of their members said, it, it converted them all into whale freaks. So they they're sort of feel a really intimate connection with these animals. Um, move their way down the coast from Vancouver uh, toward California, um, where one of these Soviet whaling ships um, had, had come down in order to, to start whaling for the season. Um, and so sometime in June of that year, if you had been one of the Soviet uh, whalers kind of hanging out on your, your uh, factory ship, um, you would have heard you know, a bunch of guys with a guitar singing at you from way down low, because you know, mm -hmm. these ships are extremely tall, um, on an inflatable you know, rubber raft. Um, and there's this weird moment where the Soviet whalers start dancing along, because you know, these guys just sort of show up and are playing music. <laughs> Um, but it turns out that they don't actually have a lot in common um, after this, this little moment. Um, the, the men on board the Greenpeace boat are immediately really appalled. Um, you know, they've just spent all of this time you know, hanging around gray whales in, in a pretty peaceful fashion. Um, and what they watch is the Soviets trying to kill a pod of sperm whales. Um, and it's, it's kind of this, this shocking moment. Um, one of them recalled later, he says that we realized that there was a beast that fed itself through its anus, which he meant the sort of spillway that the, uh, the whales are drawn into the factory ship. And it was into this inglorious hole that the last of the world's whale, that whales were vanishing right before our eyes. And so the, um, the Greenpeace activists go out and they start filming this. Um, and the, the film footage is really priceless in terms of kind of making people aware more generally um, of the Soviet whaling program. And I think help uh, kind of push some American consumers toward asking questions about what's in their dog food um, and what's in their carburetors um, that they weren't necessarily paying attention to before. Um, and the Soviets would spend the next uh, several years being actively pursued around the whale, around the oceans and particularly off the North American coast, which had become a really important whaling ground um, by Greenpeace. Um, Greenpeace would get directions from uh, the Pentagon because the Pentagon thought uh, Soviet whaling vessels were a surveillance front because they were hanging right outside international waters. Um, and then the Greenpeace activists would sort of try to put their bodies between themselves um, and the harpoons. And it seems to have become kind of sort of the final nail in the coffin of the, the Soviet whaling industry, which was already kind of questioning its reasons to exist. Um, in part because there simply weren't enough whales anymore for them to fill the plan. Um, so that kind of primary motivating work that made being a Soviet whaler kind of a thing you could do with pride and a thing that allowed you to have both material um, and kind of social benefit was decreasing. Um, the, the ships start coming back under plan year after year after year. Um, <coughs> eventually the Soviets drop um, their requests to increase the quota killed from the International Whaling Commission. They stop over harvesting uh, over IWC limits even before Greenpeace kicks into action. Um, but the fact that they're now being directly harassed um, at sea and this kind of sense that the, the moral sort of weight of the world was turning in on them um, is sort of one of the reasons why the Soviet fleet in 1979 withdraws its ships um, from the North Pacific. And that's just a couple years before there's a worldwide moratorium um, on industrial whaling. And I think, to sort of sum up very briefly, that there are kind of two big ironies in this story. 
One is that socialist whaling, which starts off with such a commitment to the idea that it can sort of do this thing better than the capitalists, that it's not going to repeat the mistakes of uh, commercial whaling that had you know, so decimated the world species and had been really costly to human lives in uh, the Soviet Northeast, um, is actually no more able at the end of the day to kind of discipline itself and uh, keep its appetites at um, kind of in a restrained, um, at a restrained level than the, the capitalist variant was. And the other is that the socialist kind of moment of excess comes right at this moment um, when the kind of capitalist countries are radically shifting the way they understand whales from one where whales do have value as the source of some products, or maybe too many products, um, to one in which whales are really these kind of only valuable when they're alive, when they're these kind of mystical creatures at sea. Which means that whaling becomes another way to sort of judge socialism as a failure um, by the West, that it's another kind of mark against the Soviet state that they keep whaling so long. Um, and it becomes a way, in some ways, for, I think, the United States to misremember um, the 20th century as a century in which socialist whaling is the, the major issue at sea, simply because it was the last group of whalers at sea. Um, when for, you know, in just sort of sheer numerical terms, most whales killed in the 20th century and most whales killed um, in any century were killed for the market. Um, they were not killed by socialists. And of course, for the whales themselves, it doesn't really matter um, who's trying to kill you. Um, the, the 20th century was really just one uh, where the, the kind of general human tendency to value them only dead um, pushed most of these species uh, right up to the brink of extinction. And on that cheery note, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Plenty of time for questions and comments. So, uh, be happy to feel them. Yeah, uh, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Did you have an opportunity to interview any people who had worked on these ships or been involved in the whaling industry? Yeah, I talked to a couple um, and have read. There, there's like an amazing kind of whaling nostalgia industry, um, yeah. mostly based in Vladivostok, that's also published a ton of stuff. Um, and I mean, one of the whalers told me, um, he was like, well, I mean, the reason we whaled is because it was communism. Like, n not that because communism made me whale, but because on those ships, like, he, he was basically the guy who kind of led me to this idea that the experience of whaling felt very communist, it, particularly, because he's like, yeah, that's, we had everything, right? We had access to the, the sort of exotic travel, our labor was well re re rewarded, we were heroic. Um, it's it's remembered in, in those kind of terms. It's actually, to me, it's remembered the way that if you go to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, you see the Yankee whaling period remembered, which is, yeah, like we, it was kind of terrible in some of the particulars and it wasn't very good for the whales, but the labor was really heroic um, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of kind of emphasis and, and frankly, comparisons with Moby Dick in, the, mm -hmm. um, in both cases. Yeah. Uh, so I have questions about two other actors. Um, just as actors. So one is Japan. Right. Japan. Yeah. Okay, but then, uh, the second one is um, what about uh, native whaling? Um, uh, I mean, native techniques of whaling and what happened to the, uh, those people? I, I, I knew um, Anna Kurtula. Yeah, Kurtula? Yeah. I must know her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> the tiny world of people who've been to Chukotka. Right. Yes. And I really remember um, in her wonderful book, Out the Bright Sea. Uh, that uh, she talks about these um, American um, native peoples making contact with uh, Soviet, I don't know if they were too cheap, but, but the people on the coast, uh, in the 1990s. And having these kind of, her, her take was basically at least the American thought, they were teaching the, the Russian, mm -hmm. let's call them Russian, uh, the Russian natives how to whale again because these old ways had been had been lost, and there's a very beautiful incident where an old lady in there takes a taste of whale blubber and says, "I remember this from my youth." So I, I wonder what you think about um, that part of the story. Yeah, those are both good questions. Um, the Japanese their story. There are people kind of working on the the post-war Japan program 
um, and I'm awaiting their work really eagerly because my sense is that the Japanese story actually looks quite a bit like the Soviet one, um, mm -hmm. and that there's there are a similar set of kind of the capacity to project national power without it having anything to do with the military, um, which I think is part of what part of why this is useful for the Soviets and part of why it's useful for the Japanese, and part of why it's still useful for the mm -hmm. Japanese. In the they just pulled out of the International Whaling uh, yeah. Convention last January. Um, and I have absolutely no empirical evidence to prove this because I don't speak Japanese, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is not a similar kind of way of maintaining a marine presence and a robust one, um, and one that is, has kind of a nice nationalist core to it without ruffling any feathers of having a, okay. a navy. Um, and the, the indigenous whaling question is really interesting in this, the, particularly the, the late 70s and the early um, 80s and into the 90s, um, and I think Anna Kurtula's book does a good job of kind of talking about what happens at the, the right when the Soviet Union collapses, um, which is that in the, the Soviets kind of start their whaling program in part because they think indigenous whaling is really inefficient, um, and that by the 1960s, all whaling is being done with kind of small um, all, all whales that go to feed indigenous villages are being killed with kind of small industrial uh, vessels off the Chukchi coast, um, as opposed to having indigenous people in open boats go out. Um, the, the Chukchi and the Yupik are basically uh, prohibited from that kind of whaling for a number of decades, even though they're eating lots of whale. But they're eating gray whales, which they don't like as much, mm. uh, which is part of that scene in, in Anna's book where they finally get a bowhead and there's this amazing moment of eating the right kind of whale again. Um, and so after the Soviet Union collapses, there was a kind of a delegation of people who came over from the Alaskan side um, and went and spent some time in Chukotka um, to kind of reintroduce the use of harpoon technologies and things. There were some people in Chukotka who still had done it, but it had been a number of years since they'd been able to. Um, and then at some point in the 80s, the International Whaling Commission stops all whaling entirely. So no indigenous whaling, no commercial whaling, no any kind of whaling. Um, and it's, it's basically through political organization on the part by uh, indigenous people in the Bering Strait um, that kind of gets the right to whale back. Um, and now there's a quota um, so that each village has a certain number of strikes they can make each year, uh, depending on where they are. Yeah, we have it. Um, I'm also curious about the guys on the boat um, and what they were thinking and how seriously or earnestly we should take the narrative of uh, communism on one vessel. Um, because in, a, in one, in one, you're sort of you're telling a very both a very recognizable story about Soviet industry and then a very kind of unique story about Soviet industry, like the idea, especially in the '50s, that um, you know a plan was sent down. Actually, things didn't really work out like that, and, and experts pointed it out. They were they were quelched, and the idea was right. technology is going to fix yeah. this and, and square the circle here. And but the typical story that I've heard, and, and this is like mostly you know, factories and, and fisheries, yeah. is um, is that then people just start stealing stuff mm -hmm. and it works out. <laughs> um, it seems like you're saying that people weren't stealing stuff necessarily no. and that there maybe it was because there wasn't actually a market yeah there was, the there was no steal. reason to yeah. steal it um and in that case it makes me wonder is there actually a third ledger that we don't there might be yeah i mean i guess yeah. there always might be um and yeah would you yes. lean more towards the like this is a typical industry of the soviet union or is this is an atypical so it this is a question that that haunts me and i it's hard to answer because um, basically all of the discussions, like the high level discussions about Soviet whaling are classified. Mm -hmm. um, so every now and then like I get some snippet of people at Gosplan talking about it that, where it like leaked out from somewhere else, but I'm sure that there are meetings, like there are meetings about everything where they're talking about, oh my gosh, we're having trouble because things are being stolen or we're having trouble because of X, Y, and Z, and I don't, I don't. I it might be illegal. Them. In the like the procuracy, I mean, usually the only reason that comes out is because yeah. there's a big scandal. So right. maybe it didn't. Maybe and there maybe, wasn't a whaling. Scandal. Maybe there wasn't a whaling scandal, yeah. or the scandals were dealt with in house. In house, yeah. because they, I mean, they were gone for sometimes 18 months at a time. So uh -huh. some of it might be, you know, 
the captains would probably not put that in their logs in those kind of terms because those were official documents and um, I mean there's like a whole layer of experience that I, I really don't have access to and it's, it is super frustrating um, and you know talking to the the guys who are on these whaling ships now is like great and fun because they tend to be I mean they look like guys who spent their lives on a whaling ship but you know they're they're also nostalgic and mm -hmm. they're complicated sources too in terms of how they kind of interpret this. Uh -huh. um, but they they haven't given you a sense of the, that there was like some kind of side project. Or no, yeah. and the, the thing that I've the, the place where there could potentially be a side project is if they were able to kind of sell or offload the meat to um, no to uh, Japan. Oh, okay. Um, and that's where I actually think the answer is sitting in an archive in Japan, um, and I just can't read it um, <coughs> because nobody else by this point was buying it, really. But particularly by the early '70s, um, so that makes it such an interesting case, though. Like, yeah. what happens when there's no market for the thing? That, I mean, maybe they sold their spears or something. Like they probably found right. something. Right. Yeah, I'm sure, and I know that they they wanted to have things they could sell because they stopped these amazing. Like they could come home with blue jeans, right? Uh -huh. Like part of the reason it was amazing when the ship landed in Vladivostok is because they had just come from New Zealand, and um, you know, so they had access to all kinds of cool things. But it didn't, I, you know, the the places that they landed that I can access through English, um, like New Zealand, didn't want the whale meat. Um, in fact, they hated it when the whale ships came into harbor because they smell so terrible um, that the newspapers are like full of these like. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, the ship is here. Um, stay away from the port. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, thank you for this really interesting talk. Um, so, as I was listening to you, I was thinking that uh, the story you're telling also resembles the story of the involvement in the British Icelandic court wars. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know if there's some you came across evidence of. Uh, that uh, unlike whales, called really was, uh, I will resource, uh, at least according to what I said, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not true, uh, if you would share insights on this. And the second question is uh, similar to the previous one, which is, is there evidence of uh, criticism of uh, the treatment of whales or the Republic Union, not just on the ship, but mm -hmm. it was an environmental movement, so what kind of responses have you seen? Yeah. Um, so on the on the last point, it's actually really interesting to me that Soviet there, there's kind of a, a flowering of interest in cetaceans in the Soviet Union in this period, but they're almost all dolphins, mm -hmm. which are not commercially harvested. Um, and some of the most sophisticated research around dolphins and how dolphins communicate is done by Soviet marine biologists, um, and that's all over the press simultaneously with, I mean, they're practically next to each mm -hmm. other with this kind of celebration of the Soviet whaling vessels. Um, the people who are really pushing back against the program are mostly other marine biologists who are working on the Soviet whaling fleet and are really concerned about it. Um, but it is not picked up the way, like pollution in Lake Baikal or some of those other really kind of touchstone moments are. And kind of bizarrely to me, at the exact moment when the Soviet Union ramps up its whaling program, they do the exact opposite with marine mammals, with other marine mammals in the far north, that they actually put into place a very sophisticated and sustainable um, protection regime around walruses and seals. Um, so it, you know, one hand is doing one thing and another hand is doing a completely different thing. Um, I actually think part of the reason that, that whaling goes up is that they're international. Um, that they're not, you know, the marine mammals become Soviet because they they come onto Soviet ground at some point, and the the whales there is this kind of sense that you can steal them from somebody else because they don't have a national home, um, and I also think it's because it sits under the Ministry of Fisheries and it's a really good way to fill kind of the biggest level of the Gosplan fisheries quota because they're measured as fish, so if you're trying to increase fishing output, a blue whale gets you there really quickly. Um, and I actually don't know, I mean, Betty knows way more than I do actually about Soviet fisheries, um, but I was just talking two weeks ago to a National Atmospheric and Oceanic Administrator who worked for a long time um, as a regulator on fishing boats in the Grand Banks, 
Um, and he, he basically described to me that in the 70s, the Soviet fishing fleet was doing exactly what the Soviet whaling fleet was doing. He's mm -hmm. like, we didn't have enough power basically to do anything. But he's like, if you went to the Grand Banks at night, he said it was lit up like a Christmas tree because all of the Soviet fishing fleets were out and they all turn on their lights to make the, the fish surface. Um, he's like, they were fishing completely off the books. Um, and we all kind of knew it and we, we couldn't do anything about it because you know, he's like, we were out there in our little cutter, like we weren't gonna interrupt it. Um, so that is, that is like an, uh, an anecdotal answer, but that's kind of my sense. And that, I mean, that's kind of true of fisheries. It's not a Soviet issue, but yeah. Women on the ship? Yeah, so there were a lot of women on the ship. So the doctors, nurses, were there workers also? Yeah, so the women... Um, Except for the harpooners. Yeah, not very many harpooners were women, but every once in a while. Um, but women did work on the, the disassembly line, um, and they worked, um, I mean, they worked kind of a lot of jobs that ha are usually coded female, like nurses and people cooking. Um, but yeah, there, there were a lot. Um, I have not found any like living women like to talk to who are on the whaling ships, because I'd be fascinated. Um, the captains, they show up a lot because there's a lot of concern about women getting pregnant on the whaling ships, and there's lots of angst um, in the captain's logs when this happens, because sometimes they're not married, and sometimes they're married, but the person they're married to is 12 months out of port. Um, and then what do you do if you have an infant on a whaling ship? I mean, there, there is lots of like logistical concern about this. Um, definitely part of it. <laughs> More so than in, on like Yankee ships, for sure. So I, I want to <clears throat> uh, get back to the, the theme sort of, sort of ulterior motives um, and, and maybe hammer home the idea of, of the Cold War context of this a bit more. Um, does the fact that so much of the archival material that you would like to see is currently in the FSB archive, does that lend any credence to the suspicions that these ships were, were covers for spying? Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about you know, fishing trawlers up, up through yeah. the Glomar Express is like, you know, it's all part of the Cold War um, right. there. And then on the question of the, the value of cetaceans, I mean, just in the news recently, there's this whole story about the, the beluga that has <laughs> yes. the, the camera yeah. on this on it. Um, and I mean, I mean, it is a little glib, but at the same time, no. yeah, um, there, there, it, it, even going back to the Cold War, there's, there's this, this sense that, you know, whales may be most useful dead, but you can also train them and use them, even the, the, the physical animals themselves as as, yeah, as means yeah. of surveillance. Right. Yeah, and actually, or sabotage. I think part of the reason that dolphins were so, um, that there was a surge of dolphin popularity in the Soviet Union is that the, the dolphin espionage program was quite sophisticated. <laughs> wow. um, partly because the American variant of this was run by a very eccentric uh, fellow who kind of devolved into like giving LSD to dolphins. Um, <laughs> so I feel like the, this. Um, the Soviet dolphin spies were probably more sophisticated than the poor American ones who were a little bit rattled. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think that that was certainly kind of a spin-off of, of thinking about cetaceans as valuable alive. Um, and I do think, I mean, my guess is, you know, these ships were hanging out three miles off the coast of the U.S. I'm, sh I'm sure they were trying to listen to stuff. And then I'm sure that's part of why the CIA was very eager when they could get, you know, Greenpeace to go bother them because, you know, it, it was part of that kind of Cold War moment. Um, and it does explain more kind of why some of these records are not mm. are not open. Um, and more than, I mean, at this point, it's, it's widely known and it's been widely known since the Soviet Union collapsed that they were falsifying records for the IWC and frankly, Nobody cares that much because there is no enforcement mechanism from that body anyway. So it's like, you know, they're not facing repercussions for, for that piece of it. Um, but who knows? So um, thank you for this uh, presentation. Super fascinating. Um, I, I want, I'm sort of like struck by two things. One is like whales as like a conservation project that people get very emotionally invested in. Um, this seems unimaginable in a Soviet context, right? Because meaning in the Soviet Union was kind of, in this way, is kind of constructed in, compared in like relation to the plan and relation to the construction of socialism, all these different ways that like whales can't be part of that except as like 
um, except as like production or extraction of value, like, like you were saying. Um, and that leads me to the second sort of like thing that really struck me is like this culture clash. Right? These Soviet like whalers on these ships, when they saw these Greenpeace activists, this it must have been like completely like not understandable, except <laughs> as like a provocatio, right? As like the capitalists have like now sent out these tiny boats to intervene with the plan, right? But they were like genuine activists. They were like kind of yeah. do this, but but there's just this real like culture clash that happens. Long hair. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you've explained why that is because the, like the two trajectories are so like opposite. Mm -hmm. But like that's such a that's such an interesting moment. And did you did you see evidence of what the sailors actually thought? about these, for example. I don't, I mean, this is both Ryan Jones, who also works on Soviet whaling, and I have been trying to track down somebody who was on the Velny book in 1973 and who was actually, could narrate some of this from the Soviet perspective, because there's really rich archives of, of kind of what the Greenpeace activists were thinking, and, and so they are describing that there's a sort of moment when everybody's dancing along, and then there's this moment of like, you can hear the record kind of screech, um, <laughs> because it, <laughs> it stops working. Um, and we have not found anybody. Um, and the, the logs, I mean, the, the Dalny Vostok's logs, which we do have, don't talk about this at all. Um, which kind of leads credence to the idea that there's a third set of log books somewhere, because they probably did write about it, it just is not in stuff that I can read. Um, so yeah, and I, part of what is fascinating to me about this case is that the, the turn in the West and the way people think about whales is so fast. Um, that it's, it doesn't take very long for whales to go from, from having the same status they do in the Soviet Union to having the sort of other status. Um, and this, you know, the, the Soviet plan idea is flexible enough that they're able to, you know, not eradicate walruses. And, you know, they, they, they make protection plans for other kinds of things. Um, so it's not, it's not just that the plan is like, so driving that people aren't able to imagine conservation. It just doesn't happen here, and it doesn't happen kind of it right. It certainly doesn't happen as like on the level of pop culture. It's happening right. on the level of like planners and like people who are within the yeah. too. So that, that's what I meant. It's yeah, that's true. There isn't quite sense. the same. Yeah. Like, um, Although I guess you said that, people are falling in love with dolphins. dolphins. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. like that was right. like so maybe it's not so cut and dry. Is there not newspaper, um, are, are there not are newspaper articles about this clash? Because I know, like, among older people in Russia today, that the name Greenpeace has these reson this yes. resonance yeah. with them. It's like, oh, these yeah, yeah. No. foreigners who don't understand the things that we've been doing forever. Which is funny, because you're right. saying that actually we haven't been doing it forever. This right. kind of a new thing <laughs> that we started doing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean, the, the Greenpeace was, was definitely publicized, publicized and, and yeah. people knew about it. Uh -huh. uh, it's mostly just the, like, actual people who saw the first Greenpeace activists I haven't been able to find. Uh -huh. But yeah, Greenpeace has a, you know, it's kind of bad, reputation. bad yeah. rep, um, pretty much everywhere up there. Yeah. After this lady, after this person, yeah. that's me. I'm actually, I was wondering that, uh, but have you, have you asked them about what their relationship, like, to the people who you interview, what their relationship to the is? and what kind of narratives do we attach to them? Because uh, from one hand, I'm uh, commenting on a lot of books, and you mentioned the KGB officers, and knowing uh, how widespread the, you know, before the death of Stalin, that any, like writing a letter to Stalin could cost the guy the life. I mean, I don't know, so I was wondering that Right, if it is, um, KGB agents probably have these books, that's why. But still, I was wondering if you ask people how they relate to whales mm -hmm. outside of the propaganda or ideologi uh, ideological discourse. As just an, uh, an example, as, uh, as you also mentioned, the Cosmos, um, the air, uh, airspace program, because uh, then Laika was sent yeah. to, the, to the space, and uh, suddenly there was all of this uh, outburst and states about Pulaika, uh, these horrible right. Soviets who are, uh, <laughs> you know, sent the dog and she's dying, which is a horrible death. Right. But for example, uh, nobody talks that the American spaceship program was more cruel, sending right. chimpanzees uh, uh, into the space under, you know, quite horrible conditions.
while Soviet space, uh, like you know, the Karalov and the uh, team had a very personalized mm -hmm. connections with the uh, dogs, and uh, each dog's death was right. a tragedy. Like, yeah. Exactly, and after like enough, actually, after Karalov's favorite dog died, he actually reconsidered your the whole, whole spaceship because of the death of the dog. So I'm just wondering that certain stories are not being told. Yeah. Either they are not asked or they are not shared. Which as yeah. you as a researcher, you know, why people right. should share. Yeah. No, and that's a really good question and I didn't talk about it here, but one of the things I, I found really interesting is that I I have a couple chapters of this book project that are about um, capitalist whaling early on. And one of the things that I found in those logbooks and particularly in the memoirs and the diaries of people, so the less kind of public facing documents because logbooks are always meant to be read by others, um, is the kind of enormal, the enormous affective cost of whaling, that the, the whalers are intimately aware of the um, the sentience and the care that whales show for each other. They're very, I mean, they have to observe it, they're up close with it. Um, and that the Soviet, there's a very similar case in the, in the Soviet world, that one of the whalers describes um, after he stops whaling, he's like, if the whales could scream, it would have been impossible to do our job. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk, both, both groups of whalers talk at length about looking in whales' eyes as they die, and the kind of, I mean, that they, they're not cut off from this simply because the kind of ideological context supports them continuing to whale, much in the way that the capitalist whalers are not cut off from feeling because the, the market context only sort of supports them if they kill these animals, um, which to me is almost more ironic in the Soviet case because it's supposed to be labor that, that prevents you from being alienated, right? Like that's the goal of the project is to set up labor conditions in which people do not have to experience that sense of alienation from the work that they do, and that the, the whalers very much did experience, or not all of them, but some of them experienced it as this really alienating thing where they have kind of an emotional reaction to the hunting that is very different from the official, um, the official worth of the animals, basically. Um, and that those those just kind of hum in an irreconcilable space under the under the surface of both of these whaling practices. That it's really it's emotionally difficult work, uh, basically. Um, and I think in some ways that the um, yeah, and you, I think you can almost tell the Soviet whaling story much like the story about Laika. That you know we can we can obsess about it because they were sort of one of the last countries to do it industrially. But in many ways, this is a story about market failures, um, first and foremost. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, in the Cosmos story is also that, that when uh, the Russians tried to, when they were, uh, went to see which animals can be sent, mm -hmm. and they did consider the chimpanzees, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the monkeys, and they went to, circ uh, to circus, and they talked to the people who tend them and said, no, you cannot do with the monkeys because they are extremely emotional. Extremely uh, affected, and you really have to knock down the emotions. Right, you need to calm. Order, yeah. In order to, you know, to. <laughs> Doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so they didn't give them. So, and I think it's what you said about the, I mean, the Marxist analysis of alienated labor um, lacks, well, as any analysis of the labor lacks the affective element right. and emotional labor of uh, affect and the attachments. And it's only recently when it's you right. know introduced that you can't perform the job. It doesn't matter in a socialist way or mm -hmm. thinking of labor or in a capitalist way. It's just affective element is not counted in as a, as a gender or any right. other element. So I think that it's an interesting twist which can be introduced not only talking about these characters as you know as uh, on. Um, uh, you know, the socialist homo sabbaticals who perform right. something, which I think that we should also give them a sense of the human uh, uh, affective uh, mm -hmm. uh, feeling. Yeah, space to care, I think. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Uh, just one point. I would think that the captains of these whaling ships would have to have been party members, right? Because they were traveling all over the yeah. world, they could have defected, plus they would have had to, re they would be the point person. Uh, to report back to the party and 
to be cognizant of the surveillance that was going on. Yeah, that's my, my sense is that almost all of them were. And party membership on the ship was really high, mm -hmm. um, generally. It, again, yeah. Because yeah, not, I mean, not surprisingly. International travel, right et cetera. I also wanted to mention that Greenpeace is still at it in the Arctic, as I'm sure you're well aware. Uh, I, as you may know, I'm in the business school at Northeastern University, and I recently reviewed a paper uh, that analyzed the interaction between Greenpeace and Gazprom in the mm -hmm. uh, in one of the northern seas, uh, and uh, how Gazprom just kept putting off Greenpeace in addressing various issues that that they had uh, brought to light. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, negotiation and uh, well analysis of how such a huge power as, as Gazprom can, can just kind of flick off uh, you know, <laughs> to, an, to the annoyance. The consternation of Greenpeace, yeah. <laughs> You may, I think that you said this, but it was happened very quickly, but what, you kind of gave us three reasons for why they kept waiting, but why, why did they start again? Why did they start? Yeah, because you said that, you mentioned that the idea came up in the war, but it didn't happen in the war, and then it happened when they actually didn't need the food. I mean, were they doing it just because, like, the capitalists had done it, and they, or is it, because, I mean, this happens at the same time that they started industrial fishing that all well fish, right. mm -hmm. also. So it starts in the 1930s, um, and at the very beginning, it is, um, it's really conceived of as sort of a regional food security program, that if you can have a kind of a more efficient industrial scale ship, but it was really only supposed to provision kind of Kamchatka and Chukotka. Um, and then that, that's the thing that after the war kind of takes off and becomes this whole other massive um, and I think that the origins are in the sense of food crisis, um, but then kind of outstrip the, the crisis pretty rapidly. Um, so somewhere, somewhere kind of in the war, it switches from being kind of a regional program to one that can be nationally important, which I think is the real turning point in some sense. Um, <coughs> the first part won't be formulated so much as a question, but it strikes me that you have a really interesting case study for what what it means, like what market forces do in this particular context and where markets and the environment come together. And I feel like the whaling industry in particular is unusual insofar as eventually the market, for it, because there are no markets to buy it, actually produces better change in the long run, obviously after a lot terrible has gone wrong. But I think what's interesting to then put onto that is what markets mean in the Soviet Union. When is the Soviet Union a country which, you know, is theoretically determining its own supplies and demands yeah. for things when market forces affect them and change policies and when they can continue whaling right. even though it makes no economic yeah. sense. And I know, I know you've, you've said that and I think you've laid it out in such a beautiful way in thinking about the ways in which markets do and don't work in the Soviet Union. Um, unrelated to that, I'm curious about um, if you could say a little more about archival sources. Presumably you've also done US archival sources mm -hmm. and I'm curious how the U.S. sources were looking at Soviet whaling, and whether you have access to some of those maybe higher level security documents through FOIA requests that you would never be able yeah. to do. Yeah, so the, the U.S. side is much easier because the U.S. doesn't think about whaling as a security right. issue for the most part, because <laughs> they didn't have a whaling program. Um, I don't know what it'd be like. I haven't looked at the British archives, which might have their own thoughts about this, because their their program went until the 19, late 1960s. Um, but. The Americans were, what is shocking to me actually is that the Americans remain kind of, um, they're very concerned about overwhaling in general, but they see it entirely as a, as a market problem. And they're actually really, um, they don't really see the Soviets as being any different in a lot of ways until, until the late 60s when they, they start to be pretty sure they're cooking the books. Um, but. For the most part, they just see this as being kind of the latest in a long kind of tragedy of the commons list that, you know, they, they understand basically because of the American whaling industry that unless there is regulation, the industry will, will kill itself, quite literally. Um, so they're mostly trying, they're mostly fixated on the kind of diplomatic problem of getting countries to sign on and actually agree to and follow a completely unenforceable <laughs> code of conduct, um, which basically means that the International Whaling Commission never has a lot of power, um, 
and the quotas are always really high because they can't get countries to sort of bring them down. Um, yeah, but I haven't I haven't seen them um, kind of other than the you know the things that have been declassified by the CIA sort of talking about the ways in which they give Greenpeace information about um, the whaling program so they could so they could sort of harass them off the coast. Um, that's kind of the only glimmer I've gotten from those archives. I mean, is there issues in the fact that just how close they're getting to the U.S.? I mean, I mean nobody likes it, but they are right they outside. Can't do, they can't do anything. They're, they're very careful to stay right outside territorial waters. Um, and I mean, the U.S. does the same. Particularly up in the Bering Strait, they're always just like tiptoeing around each other's territory. Would you mind spending a few minutes talking about your experiences uh, living for two years in the far north and being a dog sledder and how that came about? Would anybody else be interested? Brandon, <laughs> I blame you. Um, you um, so I moved to a little village in the Canadian Arctic when I was 18 instead of going to college. Um, what was it called? Old Crow is the name of the village. Mm -hmm. Um, and I planned on staying there for about four months or three months or something and then I was going to go to Costa Rica um, and I've still never been to Costa Rica um, <laughs> because I, I really quite fell in love with my job there. Um, I didn't have, have any idea what I was doing when I first got there. I was like a farm kid from Iowa. I didn't know a sled dog from any other kind of dog. Um, but the, the process of learning how to I mean, really learning how to not die in that landscape um, was incredibly compelling. Like um, the, the sense of having to learn this whole new suite of kind of physical tasks and then learning how to work so closely with the dogs. Um, so yeah, I was hooked um, and basically had to promise my parents I'd eventually go to college um, and then stayed up there for quite a while and have been back whenever I can. And somehow then that got you over to the, to Russia. Yeah, so I, um, my husband and I did the Peace Corps in the former Soviet Union right after college. Um, and I had been studying international development in a rather skeptical vein um, in college. And then I showed up in Moldova and was completely fascinated by the fact that simultaneously everything seemed very familiar and absolutely different, like the, that kind of, the sense that there was a, a similar emphasis on some sort of development, but that the sort of physical manifestations of it were often really different was really fascinating to me. And then I realized that if I was interested in the Arctic and I was interested in sort of socialist development, I should probably study Russia because they have a lot of both. Um, and that that's sort of what made the connection. And then I ended up working on the Bering Strait because it, um, it's kind of this magical comparative space where the ecology is virtually the same. Um, the indigenous cultural groups are similar or exactly the same in some cases. Um, and then in the 20th century, they kind of diverge in these, these two economic systems. Is there a book that we can learn more about? <laughs> Thank you, Rianne. <laughs> um, there is. It's coming out in August. Who's the publisher? Norton. Did Farley Mowat uh, talk about Russia in his book? I, I'm from Canada, and I, uh, every Canadian was familiar with that book yes, uh, yeah. when it was published in the 70s. I can't remember. He can't went remember. to Russia a bunch. He goes to Kamchatka, and then he actually hangs out with this Chukchi writer um, for quite a bit in the 1970s and 1980s. But I don't think, I think A Whale for the Killing is all about Canada, um, if I'm remembering it. Other questions or comments? Thank you for a wonderful